Questions? <coughs> yes. Yes. I, there's a microphone, I think, right over there. Just make sure, because there are a lot of people in the room, so it's probably worth walking over to the microphone. Hi, uh, Mr. Bergen. First of all, thank you for your time. Um, second of all, I um, you just um, mentioned this quote that I wanted to question you about, declared the global war of terror or over after Bin Laden died. Um, what, how would you characterize what's going on right now? Uh, you have a new Tal Taliban leader in Pakistan. You have the stuff going on in Yemen, Somalia, all over. Um, what? What would you? What would be your characterization of what's going on right now? Yeah, one way of answering that is on May 23rd, President Obama gave a speech at the National Defense University, <coughs> which um, I think was a very important speech. It was the first really big speech about answering your, the question you've just asked. Uh, you know, he's done speeches about Guantanamo. He's done speeches about elements of this, but this was his first big speech about national security, counterterrorism, and what he what he wanted, I think during that speech was to begin a discussion about do we want to be in a permanent state of war? Does the United States want to be in a permanent state of war? Which, by the way, I don't think is something that is a particularly American concept, um, and I don't think is pretty either and, and isn't a particularly desirable one. Um, and wars shouldn't go on forever. Uh, that doesn't mean that the threat from Al Qaeda is going to be zero, um, but it does mean that we should, you know, the threat from Al Qaeda has clearly receded. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, there's a new leader of the Pakistani Taliban, which is certainly very bad news for Pakistan, but is kind of probably not a huge issue for the United States once we remove combat troops from Afghanistan. Now, the president, who after all is a constitutional law professor, in this speech talked about the authorization for the use of military force, which is the congressional authorization to use military force after 9-11, which authorized the war in Afghanistan. Now, nobody voting for that, and it passed with only one no vote uh, at the time, realized that this was gonna authorize America's longest war, that it was gonna authorize military operations in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and potentially any other place in the world where Al Qaeda or its allies exist. And I think that the president was trying to say in the speech that we need to have a discussion about sort of winding this down. And um, that doesn't mean that if Hillary Clinton is president or if Jeb Bush is president or whoever is president in 2016, that they wouldn't be able to take um, action, military action against forces within Al Qaeda that pose an imminent threat to the United States. Uh, because after all, Bill Clinton did that. Uh, with the embassy attacks in 1998. He didn't need an authorization of uh, war authorization to go after bin Laden's camps in 98 in Afghanistan. So I, I think the president was right to start having that conversation. And the reason that he started this conversation now, rather than in December 2014 when combat troops, US combat troops leave Afghanistan, is that it takes a long time to change things in Washington. Arguably, you know, things will never change. but. Um, I think it's a, the right discussion to be having. Uh, of course, there would be certain outcomes of such a decision. If we said we're no longer in a state of war, what do we do with the 40 plus people in Guantanamo who have not been charged with a crime, but are regarded as being too dangerous to release? Since right now they're held under the laws of war, um, what do you do with them? To what extent would this impact the U.S. drone program? Because many of the authorizations that authorize the program, particularly in Pakistan, are associated with the authorization for the use of military force. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be an easy discussion, uh, but I think it's certainly a worthwhile one. Uh, you, you write about in the book um, the time that bin Laden is in Afghanistan and his sort of seemingly tenuous relationship with Mullah Omar. And I, I just wanted to ask you, maybe you can kind of expand on it a little bit more. Uh, it seems really interesting because you write how right after 9-11, Bin Laden seems a little nervous about taking responsibility because he doesn't want to put Mullah Omar in this position of, you know, oh, what do we do with this guy? Do we give him up or not? Um, but at the same time, Omar had talked about, even before 9-11, okay, we're not going to give him up and, you know, we're going to protect him. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how their relationship really worked and if it was respect or if it was just Omar trying to protect his own interests and 
Yeah, I mean, let's start with a fact. Let's start with Mullah Omar, who uh, is still with us uh, somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, Mullah Omar is a village mullah. And by the way, in Afghan sort of uh, social hierarchy, that was a very, very low position to have uh, historically. Uh, a deeply unsophisticated guy. Um, when he own, on, in the five years that he ran Afghanistan, he only visited Kabul, the capital, twice. He stayed in Kandahar. When a visiting delegation of Chinese diplomats <coughs> came to give him a gift, uh, it was a like figurine, you know. He reacted in horror as if they'd sort of, you know, attacked his wife uh, because he, you know, the whole concept of a of a of an animal figurine was reprehensible to him. So. I think Mullah Omar was a very unsophisticated guy who kind of got lucky um, and um, his relationship with bin Laden, you know, was based on he respected bin Laden's, uh, the fact that bin Laden fought during the Afghan war. But, you know, bin Laden didn't really respect him in any meaningful way because he didn't clue him in about, I mean, bin Laden led to the fall of the Taliban regime. Um, and uh, so, and, and basically lied about what he was doing. So I think their relationship was, you know, Bin Laden just sort of manipulated Mullah Omar. And if you look back, in fact, in some ways the dress rehearsal, for, I mean, it, you know, I mean the, the fact that Mullah Omar destroyed this, the great Buddha statues in Bamiyan, which were been there for 1500 years, I mean, this was definitely, those statues have been there for 1500 years, including the seven or eight hundred years that Afghanistan's been a Muslim country. No one has paid any, you know, no one's touched them. So it was, it was really the sort of Wahhabi bin Laden ideas that, that led to their destruction. Yes, you are one of the few people that met with bin Laden, a uh, journalist that met with bin Laden. Uh, after the official interview or before, were you able to somehow speak with the individual? Was he able to uh, deal with you as a, as a person or it was just business and that's it? It was mostly business. You know, a friend of mine uh, made a film based on this book for HBO and he found footage that I didn't know existed which is sort of kind of a little, it was footage that was shot before and after the interview and you know, it shows Bin Laden relaxing and having a cup of tea and He's sort of kicking back and he's sort of laughing a little bit. Uh, um, so, you know, he, but we didn't have, it wasn't, we didn't have a substantial interaction. We had a cup of tea with him and it wasn't a sort of warm and fuzzy meeting. Uh, it wasn't hostile either. I mean, he was there to do his interview and we were there to film it. Um, so, you know, my reaction to him was, he seemed well informed and intelligent, serious. The people around him seemed, serious. They, a lot of them spoke English. They were educated. Some of them didn't speak in English. They're sort of guards were seemed to be from a different social class, but a lot of the people in the, you know, who were dealing with us were high, you know, quite educated. Uh, but, you know, I didn't, it was an hour and a half in his company. It was not, you know, wasn't time to really assess what he's like personally. I did then spend many years invest, you know, talking to his friends and family about him, colleagues, acquaintances, and, uh, you know, a fairly universal picture emerges, which is this guy is fairly humble, never raised his voice, didn't seem like he'd be much of a leader. In meetings when he was in his 20s, he'd barely, you know, he'd be in a room for hours without saying anything. And so what changed, I think, um, I think the, you know, the big change is that I think when he went into Afghanistan in 1985, he started fighting the Soviets personally. I think that changed him. He took a lot of risks. He uh, subjected the people he was with to a lot of risk. Uh, they, these were 21-year-old, 22-year-old Saudi under you know, university graduates. None of them had an idea about how to fight. And they came there to die. They didn't come there to fight in a way. Um, but I think that experience changed him. And by, 90, by the time he was about 30, he founded Al-Qaeda in 1988. He was um, 29. And by then, he had sort of the courage of his own convictions. And a lot of people told him, his old friends started leaving him around this time saying, you know, you don't have any military expertise. Why you find, you know, you shouldn't be involved in recruiting people for a military organization. So 
So I think that, that experience seems to be a, something that made him change. Yeah, yeah. So w one frivolous question and one um, reasonably serious. I, I thought that when he was captured, there was a cache of porn so that, uh, you know, he was watching Peter Bergen on CNN and, and doing you know what with his porn. So, but it, it, it's not mentioned. And I just wondered whether that was totally apocryphal um, up there on the third floor of the compound. Yeah, I, I think that was a very rare instance of effective information operations by the CIA. I <laughs> see, they put it out. Wow. No, I, did, I don't think that that I, doesn't fit with him. No. no, I know it was odd. The the, the other the, the just about torture. I mean, you 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 show and you talked in, in your talk in, in in your presentation, but also in the book about how, how Greystone Operation Greystone started right after CIA, after 9/11, uh, uh, authorized by uh, <clears throat> uh, by Bush, and just you know one person after another, everybody was tortured. And these coercive, um, and, and you, you described some of them just now, but the, the, the role of torture in the process of the hunt for bin Laden is extraordinary. And, and, and I guess sort of what do you think about that? But also, it, it would be, uh, it, it would be uh, according to your narrative, unimaginable that they would have caught him without torturing everybody along the way who uh, 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 led to some clues that eventually ended up in the compound. I'm very sorry if I gave you that impression <laughs> because I, that was not, I mean, I try to sort this out in the book to the best of my ability and, you know, much of the information is not, you know, that you need to make a final determination is in public. And I mentioned the 6,000 page report that the Senate Intelligence Committee, they've spent, they've, I think, looked at 6 million documents. It's been a three year process. I mean, this, and it's led by Senator Dianne Feinstein and she's been fairly clear along with Senator uh, Chuck Levin, who's also part of the uh, task force, that uh, co coercive interrogation, I use the word term coercive interrogation in the book rather than torture, because I think torture is vague and means a lot of different things to different people. But no one could die, deny that people were coercively interrogated. They say that coercive interrogations did not lead to bin Laden, and I, I think that's a pretty defensible statement. Certainly, people in the book who gave up information about bin Laden were coercively interrogated. The question is, when did they give the information up? And until we have the actual chronology, that's going to be a hard thing to answer. But the people that I mentioned in the book, it's quite possible that they gave up information uh, before they were coercively interrogated. Uh, in fact, and we know, look, Abu Zubaydah, who was the first main Al-Qaeda leader, he gave up the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was the operational commander of 9-11 to Ali Sufan long before he was coercively interrogated. Uh, so it's true that a lot of people in the book are coercively interrogated. The question is, how useful was it? And a lot of the, and if you take, to, if you look at all the kind of leads that came from the book, uh, that, that got you to bin Laden, Many of the leads came from very traditional uh, things that had nothing to do with interrogation. So, so how did we find the real name? Ibrahim Said was that he was a Pakistani. I mean, I don't, I don't have a definitive answer for that, but I presume the Pakistanis gave it to us because they would be in a position to know. How do we track down the phone call in the summer of 2011 that indicated that this guy was still part of Al Qaeda? It was the National Security Agency, not interrogation. How did we find the compound in Abtabad? We had spies on the ground, people we recruited who followed him back. So in the book, in, in fact, the hunt for bin Laden involved every imaginable intelligence technique, including interrogations, some perhaps coercive and some not. Um, and it was a sum of all these things uh, that led to bin Laden, including, I think, just some really good deductive reasoning uh, to think about how, how do you find somebody who's taking these efforts not to, uh, not to be found. One of the things I look at in the book and that the CIA also looked at is what were the lessons of other manhunts that you could apply to this? And they were not exact, but you know, how did the Israelis find Eichmann was a big interesting question. And that, that, that involved uh, Eichmann's son had a girlfriend and he was kind of bragging about what his dad did in the war to the girlfriend's dad and the girlfriend's dad had a friend who was a prosecutor of former Nazis in Germany and somehow the Mossad got 
hold of the content of that conversation, and of course, kidnapped Eichmann. Um, so I think in all these cases, um, you know, there's, there's usually a variety of methods that, that get people caught. I knew, you know, Bin Laden was a human being and he was going to get caught eventually because he wanted to be in control. If he didn't, if he stopped communicating with anybody, he would not have, he'd still be alive today. Sorry. Thanks for, so much for um, um, being here, uh, Peter. The, uh, your book um, is read like a, um, like a breathtaking thriller. And Thank you. But <laughs> But at the end of the day, as an academician, um, we tend to kill those kind of stories and, and parse them. And I'm thinking, I found myself thinking along the same lines as um, Chuck. I wanted to ask about torture, but if we take the, the manhunt, and now I'm going to devoid it of a, any uh, fictional um, or any like really storytelling uh, interest, and just look at it as a case study in counterterrorism. Um, just because it is very visible, very um, well executed, very well detailed. Um, then the, we have the um, question of the torture that um, Chuck stole. Um, uh, and then there is the idea of um, Al-Kuwaiti. Um, it was by some sort of a surveillance um, that Al-Kuwaiti was um, you know, discovered. And I'm thinking, one of the things that I was thinking reading it is, how much would that contact be within an NSA, um, you know, larger circle versus the NSA more, um, you know, how much would it would that contact be considered a civilian rather than a known um, terrorist? That's one thing. The other um, is um, and and so on and so forth. There are there yeah. are many other things. So we have the, the question of torture. We have the question of surveillance. Um, I also had another point that I forget from just now. Oh, and, the, um, and how much was it worth to... Um, one of the things that really is um, uh, disappointing is the um, breach of trust with the uh, vaccination. I mean, the WHO yeah. um, uh, severely uh, protested this. Um, yeah, well, look, I mean, I, I, starting from the back of those questions, I mean, the Pakistan, I mean, as I think I indicated in the talk, I think it's uh, that was... Um, creative but ethically dubious and very counterproductive. Um, it didn't work and it, it, you know, it's created an environment where polio workers are being killed by the Taliban uh, with the justification that these are agents of the CIA. So, How extensive I don't know. I mean, I went to Abtabad and I talked to, went to hospitals where people were familiar with, I mean, it was, you know, no one would talk about People, you know, pa Pakistan, the, the intelligence agencies are very, I don't know, it was a difficult reporting environment. But, but clearly, I think they, they vaccinated a, a neighborhood of kids at least, and maybe two. Um, and they recruited a number of nurses. So it was a, you know, it was a, and by the way, this guy is no hero. I mean, so there's a narrative on the right that this guy helped find Bin Laden. That's total nonsense. He, uh, President Obama said he didn't tell his own wife uh, about this, uh, I, I find that a little hard to believe being married myself, but um, <laughs> but I think that was, he certainly didn't tell Valerie Jarrett or any, there was nobody in the White House who on the, nobody knew. So in the same way, why would you, this Pakistani doctor they recruited wasn't told, hey, you're part of a plan to find Osama bin Laden. He was told, we are paying you like a few thousand bucks to run this false vaccination program or in fact, it was a real vaccination program in Abtabad. All you need to know is that we're paying you and we're the CIA and that's it. So this guy, this guy is no hero. He's in prison for 33 years on um, unrelated charges of supporting the Taliban. Um, you know, and when people say, well, we sh this guy should be out of prison, I used to have two, a two-word answer, which is Jonathan Pollard, who's a Israeli, you know, spying for the Israelis, an American citizen, is still in US prison, despite the efforts of the Israelis to get him out for decades now. So I agree with you the, that it was inexcusable. In the 1970s Church Commission, you know, the CIA was no longer supposed to use journalists as cover or priests or these other things. So I Peace think it's so what? Peace Corps. Peace Corps, all these things. So the question of NSA, you know, I, I think uh, it's hard to tell, 
but I'm pretty confident two things. First of all, the Pakistanis were helpful to the United States in finding in, in this arena because they were looking, they told me that they were looking at a network of people within Al Qaeda who were speaking, um, one particular person who was speaking in a, both in Arabic and Pashto, which is sort of unusual, and that they were helping with this. And I think that's very plausible. So that's not an NSA bulk surveillance type thing. That's a liaison relationship with another intelligence agency. I don't think this is not bulk surveillance. I don't think, no one has a problem with um, the NSA spying on members of Al-Qaeda who are, or people they have a belief are in Al-Qaeda. Where the issue arises is we're gonna, that's like looking for a particular needle because you know the needle might be worth looking at. What people have a problem is creating a giant haystack that there may be a needle in someday. I mean, that's where the problem arises. And I'm pretty confident that bulk surveillance had nothing to do with this operation. But, you know, it's hard to make these judgments with any, speci you know, without the actual information. Just to summarize, though, yeah. one of the conclusions of your book would be that the, um, the current counter-terrorism um, policy, including the use of torture, use of what animal they use of, um, you know, the, the um, irregular warfare kind of like um, uh, mandate that uh, the U.S. has taken to, to, to the Tepus, we're all um, proven, at least in this case, um, Well, yes and no. I mean, look, I, 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 my book is not a his series of lessons learned. Um, it's a narrative, as you point out. And I mean, and, and you know, there's a reason that narratives work because we're sort of programmed to, to find them interesting. And uh, life, is life is complex, but also, well, no, but I think, I think more than that. I mean, look, there's, I don't think, you know, the, the two of the greatest historians of, uh, of the English-speaking world were Gibbon and Macaulay, both of whom wrote very well and wrote stories that people found interesting. It didn't mean that the fall, rise and fall of the Roman Empire was a bad book, and nor did it mean that the history of England by Macaulay was a bad book. So I don't think that there is a necessary distinction between something that is both accurate and useful and well-written. But it wasn't, I wasn't attempting to, I was trying to let the reader make their own judgments, and you've made, one, you've made some judgments from it. Um, I think if I was to, interpret the book for somebody else, I would say that the, the evidence that coercive interrogation led to bin Laden is very thin. And I had a long exchange with the script writer of Zero Dark Thirty on this issue, and I wrote 6,000 words about it for CNN.com after the, after the film came out, basically trying to lay out the case that the picture in the film that torture led to bin Laden just wasn't supported by the facts. Um, but you know, I think, you know uh, the, the counter argument to what you've just said is that um, one of the big takeaways from the documents in the compound is how effective the CIA drone campaign had been on Al Qaeda, according to bin Laden himself. Um, so, you know, not, not all of these techniques, I mean, there's, a, there's two different questions, efficacy and, 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 and e efficacy, efficacy, efficacy and ethics. And something can be, eff, you know, uh, something can be unethical while it's efficacious. Something can be ethical and unefficacious. Something can be unethical and unefficacious. Uh, so the list goes on. And I think you, I mean, hey, you'd have, we'd have to get into a more detailed discussion um, about each of these issues. Um, if Bin Laden was answering your question, he would have said, you know, Guantanamo was a great recruiting tool for me. The drones have been very bad. Uh, for my organization, so he would sort of have a, a mixed answer to your question. Maybe you would say that killing him would, would be the best thing that the U.S. could do, but also making him <laughs> Well, I mean, that, I want to go back to the question, uh, was this the best thing that the United States could do, was to making him shaheed or martyred? And I was struck by the total absence of reaction to bin Laden's death. I mean, in Pakistan, you can have a million-man march at the drop of a hat, and in fact, the number of protests after bin Laden's death were minuscule. So people didn't have that reaction. And I can't, you know, we often talk about how, you know, a particular drone strike is going to create a martyr or, I mean, if it didn't create a martyr out of bin Laden, you know, it's funny enough that the, the, the people that Al Qaeda takes seriously as martyrs are people who are religious leaders like Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. Uh, but if you're a fighter who dies in the cause, you don't become a martyr. And then you don't, it's not, 
it doesn't become a great sort of cause. Um, I have two questions, and I think they're both pretty straightforward. Um, you talked about the the real twentieth hijacker. Yeah. Um, it's just, um, are you able to talk a little bit about the background for why? There's been sort of a generally held misperception about the identity of that 20th hijacker. And um, my second question is um, in terms of the, the compound that you were able to see, and you talk about you talked about it today, and you talked about it in your book that it was quite sparse and um, under the circumstances maybe you know surprising in some ways the the, the beds that you described and how uncomfortable they presumably would be. Um, is, is your understanding of the reason for that, was it um, a strategic reason to remain you know, out of suspicion, or was it limited resources, or was it more a matter of principle? I remember you talked about in the book um, bin Laden not wanting um, his family or associates to get used to luxury so that they could you know, be prepared for life on the run. I think it was, you know, Bin Laden, um, like uh, some children of very rich people, was also very careful with money, um, and he um, almost pathologically stingy. People would complain about how little he would be paying them, paying him, um, and also money was tight. Um, and his personality was somebody he, uh, you know, he 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 seemed to revel in living out like a sort of peasant. Um, you know, when when they were living in Tora Bora which was his idea of vacation. They were living in a sort of small hovel. Um, they were, they were, there was no electricity or heat. I mean, Tora Bora is really, I mean, it's like being in the foothills of the Rockies or something. It's very cold and uh, his, you know, his family would complain and he would take them on you know, 12 mile hikes, which he seemed to just revel in. And so I think his personality was somebody who just didn't, he, w he really rejected the, <coughs> You know, in Kandahar and in Sudan, two of the hottest cities, places in the world, he didn't have air conditioning. He almost made a point of it. So I think it was his personality. Um, and on the first question about the confusion about the 20th hijacker, I think because Zacharias Moussaoui was very quickly identified, uh, it became a kind of media shorthand that he was a 20th hijacker. And of course, we now know that he was part of the second wave of planned attacks in the United States. And Mohammed al Qatani, who was the guy turned back in the summer of 2001, really was the 20th hijacker. And one of the reasons United Flight 93 didn't crash into the Capitol was because there were only four hijackers on the plane. I mean, the, the, as opposed to five, which was true on every other plane. Uh, and Mohammed, the idea is Qatani would have been a muscle hijacker on that plane. And luckily, it didn't happen. How, how do you feel about that? And, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel very strongly about it at all um, in the sense that people are. I don't think, I mean, you know, that's just the American way, I think. Um, and it's, it's, you know, Zero Dark Thirty, I think, the reason that I could write 6,000 words critiquing it as a work of history is they claim that it was a work of history. Um, that, you, you know, often if you look at a Hollywood film, it says, you know, uh, inspired by real events. But it didn't say, you know, based, you know, this is, they didn't make the claim that this was based on their own reporting and blah, 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 which was true, but you can't have it both ways. It's either a work of history or it's a work of entertainment, and they try to have it both ways. And when they were critiqued as a work of history, they said, well, it's a film, not a documentary. So I, I think it, it op they opened themselves to a legitimate question about how accurate was this. And the idea, by the way, that there was only one person in the CIA, this female played by Jessica Ch Chastain, who really wanted to find bin Laden I mean, clearly, it doesn't pass any kind of common sense test. So, um, but you know, as a film, I think it's very effective. As a piece of history, it's not as good. But I don't think anybody going there is going to think, "Wow, this is how it really happened." You'd be uh, surprised. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Well, I think this, the, I think the the account of what happened, the U.S. Navy SEAL raid on the house, is I think very effective. Uh, there is one detail that is completely wrong, which is you can see <laughs> what's going on because in the film, I mean, you can't have a film that's entirely filmed in, you know, at night. I mean, there was, this was a moonless night. There was no electricity in the neighborhood, so they had to kind of fudge that slightly. But I think it, it, it's, as an almost real-time account of what happened that night, it's very close to what happened. My second question is, uh, and this was touched on 
you know, even though it was for a very short period of time, you met the man, and you've spent a lot of time doing research about him. He reminded me tiny bit of you. If that was the question. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> In any event, my question is, uh, it, based on your instinct, based on your knowledge, was this guy a true believer, or was he someone who was out for power who made a colossal miscalculation? I think he was a true believer. And in fact, um, you know, I, can't, I was born, I was raised a Catholic, and I think you cannot, uh, it, you cannot absent his religious views from who he was. This guy was a religious fanatic from the age of 12. He, um, even as a teenager, he was fasting twice a week. He was praying seven times a day. And to say that Islam had nothing to do with bin Laden is like saying the Crusades had nothing to do with Christianity. I mean, this is a guy who was a religious fanatic. Um, and uh, so he was a true believer. And uh, you know, his idea of fun when he was a teenager was to get a group of his friends to come around and start singing religious chants about retaking Palestine. So that, he's been like this from an early age. And I, don't, I think it's tempting to try and discount people. Uh, it, some people would like to discount religion or would uh, try and discount religious beliefs, but I think they're very powerful and they certainly animated him. Um, back to the beginning. You spoke of various excuses for not taking Tora Bora with forces. What's your take on why we didn't go in with the I troops think, on the ground? You know, we, we, you know, basically one of the more incompetent military commanders of American history, uh, which is Tommy Franks. Tommy Franks screwed up two wars, it's pretty impressive to screw up one, but you know, he retired three weeks after the fall of Baghdad, uh, leaving you know, a, a mess that we now know, uh, you know it, it could have been a lot better. So he just made bad military decisions. Um, I mean, it was extraordinary. Yeah, I, I think you have to rewind the tape a little bit. The last war the United States had been involved in before 9-11 was Kosovo, in which no American soldiers had died, and a narrative and, and before that, of course, there was the Black Hawk Down incident. So a narrative developed in the Pentagon that the US public has zero tolerance for casualties and we can't have casualties. And if you read Bob Woodward's book about the first, uh, the war against, the f his very first one about the Afghan war, uh, there was, you know, Rumsfeld was apoplectic that the CIA was in Afghanistan doing all this stuff before the, before the US military. And you look at Rumsfeld's biography, you know, he's sending memos to, like, to his people saying, why can we, why can we not get people in? And so, uh, you know, the, the army was very risk averse um, and Tommy Franks was in charge and he just made the wrong decision. Um, I don't think it was that, that complicated. And oh, by the way, one kind of important detail. On December 3rd, 2001, when the battle began, uh, Donald Rumsfeld tasked Tommy Franks with rewriting the Iraq war plan, which was 800 pages long. And he had, so basically gave him a week. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the guy was, we were, you know, anyway, suffice to say, mistakes were made. So, um, Mr. Bergen, thank you for being here. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, Zero Dark 30 does give the impression that women in the intelligence community were vital or played some role in apprehending bin Laden. Is this general impression true? Yes. And, um, you know, I, I, I treat it in the book uh, briefly. Um, and the film that was based on my book um, that was on HBO kind of took that and made it into a whole appropriate story, which was the account of the female analyst of the CIA who tracked bin Laden. And Mike Scheuer, uh, who was the head of the bin Laden unit, told me you know, he would have liked to have put up a, a note um, saying no men apply uh, <laughs> for his unit because he basically said, look, women are better analysts, they're smarter, they make connections, they're more patient, they don't tell war stories, they don't take cigarette breaks. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and as a result, uh, the unit was made largely made up of women. And of course, one of the stories in Zero Dark Thirty and also in my book and, and, and the HBO film is the tragic story of Jessica Matthews, who was a mother of three in her mid-40s, who was killed by an Al-Qaeda suicide bomber at Host in December 2009. Uh, 
by somebody she thought she'd recruited to find the leader, the number two in Al Qaeda. And she was one of the original you know, people in the bin Laden unit. And there are others that I can name, Gina Bennett, who uh, um, uh, you know, played a critic, wrote the first, the, f the very first uh, memo that the US government wrote about a guy called bin Laden saying this guy's gonna be a threat was written by Gina Bennett in 1993. Uh, the, uh, another person is um, the person who wrote the August 6, 2001 presidential daily brief uh, that bin Laden determined to strike in the US. It was written by somebody called Barbara Sood who had a PhD in medieval Arabic theology from Princeton in the 70s, which must have seemed like a pretty obscure thing at the time, but turned out to be very useful uh, in her subsequent career as an Al Qaeda analyst. So the point is, is that women uh, analysts at the agency were uh, very involved, um, and the Zero Dark Thirty Jessica Chastain character does exist. Um, I didn't speak to her, but the screenwriter for the film spoke to her at length, and it very much represents her view of what happened. Uh, so, you know, there's definitely more than, I mean, it's no surprise. I mean, just, the, the CIA has changed along with society. So, the, you know, uh, it's uh, an organization where uh, women have many leadership roles. Colby's not there anymore. Right. Well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, can I ask you, in terms of ethno-nationalist terrorism, sometimes we have a direct, we have a clear role that our clear aim that terrorists are, are aiming towards. In the case of bin Laden, it's a little bit less clear. Can, I, can we get your views a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, global jihad as opposed to let's liberate Ireland or let's liberate, choose your country. So I think that it makes it much less legitimate. I mean, ethnocentric terrorism, let's liberate Ireland from the British or let's liberate um, choose your country from somebody else has a lot of legitimacy and, and also is much more tethered to uh, the public in a sense. I mean, they're, they're, uh, one of the reasons bin Laden was, uh, you know, an ethno terror, an ethno nationalist terrorist organization is going to be very careful about killing hundreds or thousands of civilians in a single attack for two reasons. They are concerned about public opinion in a way that Al-Qaeda is, is much less concerned. And they are concerned about you know, a, 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 a huge crackdown in a way that Al-Qaeda was less concerned about. So I think they're, they're very different. And it's one of the reasons that bin Laden failed. I mean, if he, if, if he had said, look, let's, our goal is the liberation of Saudi Arabia from the Saudi royal family, that would have been a lot more doable, a lot more legitimate in many ways than we're just gonna attack the United States and hope that they pull out of the Middle East as a result, uh, which was a pipe dream, uh, didn't succeed. Hi, thank you. Uh, three quick questions. The first is, uh, can you explain more about the, the uh, three quick questions. Uh, first, can you say about the, the, the second wave that you, that you mentioned with, that, that would have happened? Uh, second, what was the role of uh, Zawahiri in the whole era when he was number two? And third one, following with that, is the U.S. planning to kill him as well? In reverse order, yeah. I mean, they're definitely planning to kill him. Um, I mean, they've tried to kill him already. They almost succeeded in killing him in a drone strike in January of 2006. They killed, I think, a cousin or son instead. So, um, yeah, I think that they would... I'm sure there are people working now and trying to find where he is. Um, you had another question about Zawahiri? Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, did Zawahiri lead to bin Laden? No. I mean, there's an incredibly bad book written by a former U.S. Navy SEAL uh, whose name I'm thankfully blanking on. But he makes, he makes the claim. He says that he talked to everybody on the raid. It, it, it basically, the whole thing's made up out of whole cloth. But his, the theory of his book is that Ayman al-Zawahiri tipped off the Americans to that they could kill bin Laden. Anyway, the whole thing doesn't make sense. But... Uh, Zawahiri um, didn't lead to bin Laden. And, um, and then in terms of the second wave, the second wave was a plan by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to have sent other people into the United States and do other attacks. Most of these attacks were very notional attacks. And that means Zakiris Massawi was given 6,000 bucks, told to do what he could. Um, obviously, it didn't work. 
Uh, so it was a it was a less sophisticated group that were recruited. Iman uh, Iman Farris, who was uh, planning to bring down the Brooklyn Bridge with a pair of uh, with a like a gas torch. By the way, um, if a obviously Pakistani person uh, was trying to was took out a gas torch on the Brooklyn Bridge uh, and appeared to be trying to bring it down after 9/11. <laughs> you know, which is one of the most heavily traveled places in the world, I think it would have attracted quite a lot of negative attention. Anyway, so um, so it wasn't a serious plan, and he abandoned it. I'm he said, look, there's too much surveillance on the bridge, and he didn't, he was arrested, and uh, so the second wave of attacks were, didn't materialize because they, were, they, they, they weren't serious, and the people that they recruited weren't very sophisticated. You gave the example of <coughs> the capture of Eichmann. Yeah. Um, talking about intelligence, but in that decision-making process of the leadership of the American, you know, the, 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 the people who were deciding whether to conduct this uh, operation or not, it uh, came out the idea of uh, trying to capture him alive in order to serve. The thing is that the Eichmann trial also served as a kind of collective psychoanalysis on the wounds yeah. of, and uh, did anybody come up with that idea that a public trial of Osama bin Laden will help uh, heal wounds in American society regarding, you know, all that 9-11 and all what happened afterwards? Or nobody just, you know, take him if he resists, shoot him? You know, uh, shooting somebody who's conspicuously surrendering is a war crime. So, um, and that is not peculiar to the U.S., you know, to the operation against bin Laden. So. If bin Laden had conspicuously surrendered, he would be alive today. And there was a plan to, to take him alive. There was a plan, they, they had, they planned for every eventuality. One of which was bin Laden being taken alive, perhaps wounded. He would have been taken to Bagram Air Force Base. There was a group of FBI, CIA, high value interrogators there, Arab linguists. They would have quickly talked to him there. Then they would have taken him to the USS Carl Vinson and they would have kept him on the ship for perhaps months. Don't forget this was a covert operation which they hoped would not become public. And they would have just interrogated him on the ship for a while. So there was certainly uh, a plan if it, to take him alive. Uh, I don't think people thought it was very realistic. And so going to your question about a trial, there were lots of people at the CIA who always wanted just to kill bin Laden. They thought a, a trial would be a soapbox for bin Laden. They were very concerned that if bin Laden was captured, that he his capture would be um, the impetus for Americans being kidnapped around the world in order to get him released from prison, which I think is a reasonable concern. So there were, you know, there were disagreements about in the, in the CIA and other places about what the best course of action was. But I think bin Laden made his own choice about what he wanted, uh, you know, because he could have surrendered. Uh, I, don't, I personally th never thought he would. I took him at face value that uh, he was willing to die in this struggle. He didn't want to go to Guantanamo. He didn't want the humiliation of being taken by the Americans alive. On the other hand, he wasn't seeking martyrdom. One of the reasons, the reason that there was no, the protests uh, around bin Laden's death were so muted was uh, talk about an unheroic ending. Instead of the battlefields of Tora Bora surrounded by his men fighting off the Americans heroically, he dies in a suburban compound uh, surrounded by his three wives and dozen kids and grandkids and doesn't put up any resistance. It's not a heroic ending. But it's the ending he chose. Yeah. You you um, you, you, you seem convinced that it that it it wasn't a war crime that, that but it it the, everything you've said would indicate that of the list of possibilities at the top the most desirable was to kill him, so that other things being equal. The, the, the Navy SEALs going in probably intended to kill him. I mean, 15 yeah. minutes is a long time. The plane lands, it, I mean, the helicopter lands, it crashes, they come storming up the door, he's in the third floor, the door is open, he doesn't have a gun in his hand. I mean, it, it, you could say he didn't prostrate himself and surrender. Right. On the other hand, there was not, it would seem that the, 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 the message or the intention of, of, the, of the, 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 the SEAL team was unless otherwise proven clearly to be unarmed and to be surrendering, they wanted him dead. 
Don't, you, you seem to be arguing against that. Well, you know, let's start with the fact that I'm not a lawyer, um, or certainly not an international human rights lawyer. Um, <laughs> and this was a pretty confusing event for all concerned. I mean, one of the reasons we have different narratives by different, different Navy SEALs have said different things about what happened that night. We know from car accidents that five people watching a car accident have five different stories about what happened. So this was uh, a moonless night, no electricity. The SEALs are wearing night vision goggles. There's a firefight, first a helicopter crash in the first uh, one minute. Then there's a firefight about five minutes later with one of his bodyguards in which he's killed. Then they kill bin Laden's son. They also kill another bodyguard. They kill a woman who's married to the, one of the bodyguards. They wound bin Laden's wife. Um, you know, a visit from the U.S. Navy SEALs is not a visit from the Red Cross, so undoubtedly. But, uh, you know, I think that if he had... Um, I just think, you know, it is a fact that it is a war crime to shoot somebody who is conspicuously surrounding, and he didn't do that. Um, and, you know... I, I, but, I, but I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, I, I don't think you send the SEALs on an operation with the expectation... Uh, you know, they are designed to kill people. I mean, that's what they're, I mean, at the end of the day, that's why you send the SEAL Team 6. Um, but not always. I mean, we saw just now in Somalia uh, when they went in to try and capture, kill the guy that they were going after after the Eastgate Mall attack that they retreated. Um, they also took that guy, Abu Libby, uh, alive in Libya, in, in Tripoli just now, which was a Delta Force operation. So I can't be certain because no one can be certain given what I just described. Um, bin Laden had repeatedly said, I'm willing to die in this, and I, has, I, I think that's true. Um, <laughs> no, I, mean, I think you answered your own question. I, think. No, I mean, I think, I mean, that, you know, maybe, yeah. I, 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 he was rescued by the U.S. Navy SEALs. Or the Al Qaeda ideology that is associated with him as a brand has been um, spared um, all his um, internal.
Mr. Bergen, I would like to ask you about the role of media. Um, how, would like to, how would you address the role of media from the beginning of 9-11 attacks and until the uh, hunting of Laden and those processes? Do you think the media sort of shortened the timing of Bin Laden hunting? In kind of, is there any effect directly to the, con especially you know, in terms of counterterrorism perspective? You know, I mean, I work in the media, and it's just like everywhere else. There are some people do good work, some people do bad work, some people are sociopaths, some people are uh, lazy, some people. I mean, I think making generalizations about the media. Um, there's been great reporting. Um, there's been poor reporting. There's been very brave reporting. My friend Tim Hetherington was killed in Misrata, uh, documenting uh, the the war against Gaddafi. I've had friends who've been killed. Uh, in Iraq, um, you know, I've had friends who, um, you know, don't do their work, and yeah, you know, I, I just think sort of making generalizations about the media, uh, I think, is difficult to um, sustain. Clearly, there was a huge, uh, you know, the, in the run-up to the Iraq War, the media didn't really do a very good job um, of skeptically probing what the government of both the United States and many other countries were claiming. Unfortunately, Saddam, you know, kind of played into that by, Saddam was lying about his capacity to his own, his own generals. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, to be honest. Maybe you can clarify or... Yeah, but I think that's sort of like saying that does oxygen play an important process in life? Or, I mean, the media is sort of an imperfect reflection of reality. And, you know, I mean, is the question that the media made bin Laden into bin Laden? Or is that the question? The question is, would it be more than 10 years, like maybe not, uh, maybe seal team would have been captured him like 20 years later? Do you think that media shortened that process to capture uh, bin Laden? No. Yeah. Let me let me make the following observation. You know, if you take um, if you look at the uh, intelligence budget since 9/11, we spent half a trillion dollars, which is a very large sum of money. Um, and and I, I, this is really an observation about how it, it took. A, I don't think it took. Uh, it, it took way too long to find bin Laden, given the amount of resources we have. It should have been much quicker. Uh, so the, I, I wouldn't talk about the media in that context. I would talk about um, the failures of the intelligence community to get him earlier and um, the national security, security community writ, writ large, which isn't to say that there wasn't good work done and it was a very, you know, it was the process took a long time. A lot of good people were involved, but as I indicated earlier, he could have been stopped at the Battle of Tora Bora. Um, I'm more or less curious about your opinion on um, Al Qaeda and Syria linking up. I'm working on a thesis about Syrian insurgency right now, and obviously a lot of my research has led to that. What do you, do you think that means in terms of the United States and counterterrorism policy, or basically what, if we're at risk for something as great as an attack as 9 11 has been? Yeah. Well, you know, Al-Qaeda in Syria seems to have learned from the mistakes of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and for the moment they aren't imposing large-scale Taliban rule on the population, and they are sort of acting as a sort of kinder and gentler Al-Qaeda, and they're organizing tug-of-war contests and ice cream con eating contests and public meetings, and they seem to have learned from some of their mistakes, which is worrisome. And in fact, CNN had a very interesting piece the last three or four days by Nick Peyton Walsh where they they basically, they 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 took... They, they surveyed activists in lots of different Syrian cities to say, is Al-Qaeda, or the Al-Qaeda affiliates, which have you know, different names, are they you know, the biggest force in your town or city? And it turns out that much of northern Iraq is basically controlled by Al-Qaeda now. Um, and so that, that is worrisome. Now, it, this could play out in lots of different ways. 
Al-Qaeda in Iraq controlled a third of the country in 2006 because they controlled Anbar province. They lost it because they pissed off the local tribes who rose up against them who were then aided by the US military and they were basically defeated. And any, now in Syria, you know, will they make a s sort of similar mistakes? Will some other outside force intervene? Would the United States intervene at a certain point? We don't know. But I think it is, you know, if Al-Qaeda can stage a resurrection, it is in Syria. And they do seem to have learned from their mistakes. They're behaving more like Hezbollah, providing social services to the population. And I think that, that's, that's all a cause for concern. However, embedded in their DNA, I think are, they tend to make the same set of mistakes, which is they tend to, they want to impose, they really want to impose Taliban-style rule on the population. They, um, and that tends to go down poorly. Look at what happened in Mali. In Mali, they imposed Taliban-style rule on the population in northern Mali, which is the size of France. No one, they couldn't, they just waited around until they were liberated by the French military, which until relatively recently controlled Mali. Uh, it's not often that a country that formerly occupied you is then greeted as an army of liberation, but that's what happened. So that's how it could play out. Uh, but another way it could play out is, you know, lots of foreign jihadis go to Syria and they get training and then they try and do attacks in the West. That was a concern during the Iraq war, but it didn't happen because we're much more cognizant of the problem than they would have been during the Afghan war. So uh, that's a long way of saying I don't know what's going to happen. Um, Yogi Berra said it's hard to make predictions, particularly about the future, so that's uh, how I feel. So, you know, the, uh, uh, w one of the most interesting points you made, I thought, was that, that, the, that there were uh, f the, the absence of demonstrations when he died, and that, and that in a way it symbolizes the end of the war on terror as it was formulated by by uh, uh, by Bush, but don't you think that, and, and you said but just before we started the seminar that the book you're currently working on now is uh, Domestic Terrorism, American, and don't you think that, the, that the, 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 the way in which somebody like that can live on the internet gives a kind of an immortality to, uh, and, and a potential inspiration uh, for uh, uh, terrorists every, everywhere? Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. And if you look at Al um in like you know, literally two dozen cases in the United States and, and other cases, he he continues. He was influential on the Sane of brothers, so even in death, he's sort of influential. Um, so yeah, I mean, these ideas uh, can linger on. It's an interesting question about how ideas die. Um, you know, Marxist-Leninism is still current, probably in some pockets of uh, maybe even this college. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, but uh, no, uh, but it's uh, but you know, Marxist-Leninism died largely died when uh, you know, when the Soviet Union expired. Marxist-Leninism sort of died along with it. I think it's going to be harder to kill Al Qaedaism as an idea because it it makes claims to do with God that are uh, less sort of disprovable by actual events. So the Soviet Union didn't work. It was a Marxist-Leninist state. That spoke for itself. Since Al-Qaeda claims to be, uh, you know, that sort of authorized by God, these ideas are quite difficult to die. Uh, but I think that they can become less and less relevant over time so that they become sort of nuisances rather than national security problems. And I think we're at the stage where it's sort of a nuisance not to, uh, not to under, you know, uh, except in places like Syria, but even there, the prognosis for the reasons I've already outlined could be bad. And certainly, if you look at, our, if I was Osama bin Laden scoring this, you know, in Yemen, I lost. We control, they controlled a good chunk of the country. That's over. In Mali, they lost. Um, they've lost in Afghanistan. They've, to some degree, lost in Pakistan. They've completely lost in Southeast Asia. If we'd had this conversation in 2003, we'd be concerned about Jamaa Islamia and their capabilities throughout Southeast Asia. They're basically gone. So, um, you know, these groups, they don't have to be around forever. Listen, on that hopeful note, I think <laughs>